Welcome to the latest edition of Pass the Baton, a podcast to educate agricultural businesses and farmers on how to work through generational transfer of farms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Pass the Baton podcast. Today, I'm really glad to interview Dr. Kate Burke. Kate was referred to me, uh, in fact, by an agronomist um, in South Australia. I was having a chat over on the far west coast of South Australia with an agronomist about the podcast, about who we could interview. And he turned around to me and he said, if you interview Dr. Kate Burke, I'm going to listen to that. So I said, great. Well, I, so I grabbed the book and uh, read the book over the last couple of weeks. It's Crops, People, Money and You, The Art of Excellent Farming. And today uh, it was a chance to, to perhaps dive into a few areas of the book with Kate. So welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks very much, Tony. It's just really good to be here. Thank- and thanks for the opportunity to, to chat Crops, People, Money and You. Yeah, I'm sure it's um, it's been a, an interesting journey writing this book. Um, there's a lot of people probably re- listening to this podcast that don't know a bit about your background. Do you mind just giving a, a quick background of of well, what, what brought you to this point uh, probably in your life where you've written this book? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, Vic- Victorian, so... Uh, <laughs> Still suffering from the Crows Premiership in 1997 <laughs> as a St Kilda supporter, so I just need to get that out there. Um, yeah, so I've had a career 30 years in in uh, agricultural research and then advisory work. Mm-hmm. Grew up on a family farm mm-hmm. in, in an area in uh, north central Victoria, so you mm-hmm. know, 400 mil rainfall areas and not dissimilar red brown earth, so not dissimilar to a lot. A lot of the parts of SA. Mm-hmm. Um, most of my working career, or the first, the two thirds of it, I guess, were over in the Wimmera region. Yes. I went to Horsham after my ag science degree, started off working in the lab, and then ended up working at Longeron College as an ag teacher, mm-hmm. and um, got distracted with a PhD, <laughs> and then started doing consultancy work, so working for one of the private consultants in that area and stayed in that role for 12 years, Mm -hmm. living in a small country town. Then we had a bit of a change and I went to the Big Smoke and worked in corporate agriculture for for three years before returning back to the bush and now we're up at Echuca and set up my own advisory practice called Think Agri. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, so that that's the story. And over the years, I've had a lot to do with the um, agronomy consultant community in, in SA and the research community um, yep. and uh, love getting over there and have done a little bit of work more recently in succession with some of the SA guys as well. Nice. It's been fun. Um, so why the book? What what why did you jump out of bed one day and go, I'm going to write a book about this stuff? What what was it that motivate you and, and why did you do it? Yeah, th- thanks for that. Well, I've always enjoyed writing. Mm. Um, one of those weird people at school that enjoyed English as much as maths. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, and I love telling stories. So yeah. that was, you know, basically it was pleasure was yeah. um, part of the motivation. Yeah. And, and I guess in terms of getting the message across, I just felt there was something missing in the messages that that are out there for the farming community. So mm-hmm. whether it's about you know, growing good crops um, and the technical side of crop production mm-hmm. or whether it's about, you know, something you're very passionate about in terms of succession fam- mm-hmm. uh, planning and mm-hmm. wealth transfer, mm-hmm. I felt that there there wasn't really a publication out there that put it all together yeah. and and focused on the things we could control mm. rather than getting distracted about the things we can't control. So mm. I guess that was the motivation. I just felt there was a story and a pattern that you know, people could benefit on if I put the effort in. What has been the response to the book? I mean, have I'm sure it's been out there for and about for a little while now. How, how have people responded to it? Oh, look, really well. I'm really pleased. I um, It's a self-published book mm. and at this stage the main distribution is is through our website, mm-hmm. so it's not out in, mm. in bookshops as, as such. It is on Amazon, yep. uh, which is great. But the feedback's been terrific and mm. probably some of the feedback I've um, 
really cherished is is from the elders of yeah. our farming community. So I've had two lovely messages, one from an 88-year-old, um, one of the smartest guys I, I know, and you know, he's a terrific farmer, and the others from our, our neighbours, similarly a couple in their early 90s who um, you know, had an amazing career in farming and and they both talked about it being a, a unique book that could put out sim- simple concepts but really important concepts yeah. in, in a yeah. readable fashion and it should be a must shelf on every farm bookshelf. So when you get feedback like that from people you really respect yeah. and that you've actually modelled your own life on, um, it's it's very humbling. Yeah, I, I look at it straight away, Kate. I, I'm not a farmer, and 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 never have been, and probably, and I don't think I ever will be. But I actually found it quite easy to read and good to read from a non-farming perspective. I mean, I, I there were concepts, all the agronomy in there, and you talk about a lot of concepts in there that probably a little bit beyond my grasp. But I, you got your message across, I thought, very well. And which, but before I deep dive into a couple of those messages that I, I wanted to ask, you mentioned before, I, I found some of your your football quotes because I didn't know you before I read before I read the book and I'm seeing quotes, all these football quotes and anecdotes and, and, and speeches that had come from different football backgrounds over the years. And I had, to, I kept chuckling and I thought this lady loves her football. Uh, <laughs> why, why, what, you are very passionate about that area. It sounds like. How did that happen? You wonder. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's a couple of reasons I, I think, um, my family, I'm, I'm the youngest of six. Yeah, I've okay. got uh, an older sister and, and four older brothers and um, our father was a passionate Carlton supporter, but our mother's best friend was a passionate St Kilda supporter yeah. and, and she infected all the family um, pretty early on and because I'm the youngest, most of my siblings were of that impressionable age, I think, when St Kilda won a premiership yeah, in 66. Well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Easter Pat was the name of this lady who um, we called her Easter Pat because she used to come and stay with us every Easter to play in the local tennis tournament. <laughs> and Easter Pat only passed away um, the year before last and, and I think she spent the last 10 years apologising for um, the fact that we all barracked for St Kilda. She kept saying, oh, I'm so sorry, perhaps I should have barracked for Essendon or Richmond. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm an Essendon supporter, so you can say no. That you're probably better off barracking for St Kilda. Or, yeah, but. and Mum loved her sport and loved. You know, she was a passionate golfer, tennis player, and, and golfer. So, I, I guess it's just something that's always been yeah. in our lives in in a small community, and hmm. uh, we get a lot of pleasure out of sport. And I happen to marry a sports fanatic who's also a racehorse fanatic. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's I guess, and I just find it's an, a medium. Yeah. Um, that a lot of people relate to, particularly, yeah, I guess, I the demographic that I work with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the football analogies and, and as I said, some of your quotes uh, I thought were very useful and very uh, unique to a book like this. I, I didn't know what to expect reading and I'm picking this up, this thread all the way through and I'm like, oh, this, be, this is fantastic because I'm a football fan, obviously, myself. So yeah, um, yeah. The, the, first, the first thing I got really out of your book, Kate, that I wanted to dive into first is, is you introduced this element of, um, you know, I use the phrase locus of control and you, you mentioned it just before. And I really got that particularly early on in the book saying, you know, people underestimate how much they can control, how much they can make a difference to their outcomes, um, to their farm. And they tend to concentrate on so much they can't control versus, and, and lose sight of what they can control. That was an overarching theme. I thought, particularly, as I said, in the, throughout the book, um, do you want to elaborate more on why that's certainly a big issue for you? In this book? Yeah, sure. I, I guess I suppose lot like you when you first discover that locus of control concept, um, and for me it wasn't that long ago, it was a few years ago when I was expressing things that I was concerned about in my workplace at the time and I was chatting to someone and they got me to draw the three circles and said, well, you know, you're spending a lot of energy on this stuff that's of concern to you, but it's actually not your role to fix that stuff. Mm, mm. And and it, and it really stuck with me. And then when I look at farming businesses and the amount of energy expended on things like grain price, and I guess they're also the things that are picked up in the media. Yeah, yeah. 
um, I could just see the, that that energy wasn't going into a useful place. And if you combine that with the knowledge that the, the farms that are doing really well are uh, earning usually double that mm. of, of the average cohort, mm. then there's a massive opportunity and there's a lot going to waste out there mm. and, and, I was, and particularly when a lot of that's related to production mm. and, and meeting our um, water-limited crop potential. It just all sort of meshed together for me. If we could concentrate on those things mm. and not get fixated on the things that evidence would suggest aren't as important as we might assume they are, then you know, there's a. I think we'd be better off as as a community as a whole. Yeah, well, you gave an example in the book, I think, and I think you used the Wimmera region. Oh, I can't remember which region you use in the book, but I think you, you end up saying if every the top twenty percent you know, if everyone off the average moved to the top 20%, I think it was an extra $80 million worth of revenue to the the community. Or it was something of that ilk. You, you give a great example in the book. Yeah, that, that's right. That that example came from um, around that Horsham region, yeah. the, the, the Wimmera region, mm. and and it was for a particular year, to, to put it in context, I think it was a, I used the 2017 mm. season, mm. and um, and it was using data from... WPA, Watts Price and Associates, that have been a, an accounting firm that have done um, data collection for for a lot of years, and I think on on memory their their average uh, for that particular year was two hundred thousand um, in operating profit, mm. and um, but the the uh, the upper quartile or t- or top twenty percent, not sure which fragment mm. they. Mm they used was um was double that mm. and so i said well okay that was a pretty good year so what if you know this what, what if we took 200,000 mm. sorry 200 2000 of the the Wimmera's 3000 farmers and yep. um moved them up to that moved them up to that and then i did the calc and thought wow that's a lot of money <laughs> and that would save a lot of grant writing <laughs> <laughs> i bet and it's it's a startling number and it's a great example of I mean, I, I use a phrase that um, success leaves clues and, you know, I think do do enough farmers, should they be looking over their fence a little bit and looking around them as to what the top 20% are doing? And I think that's what you were trying to get across in your, your book or do you think that there's, is there, or is there a bit of a closed book philosophy or, well, no, I'm not doing it that way because why do you, I guess what I'm getting at is why do you think that the top 20% do it that way and the other 80% don't? Well, I think it, it, it's a bit more complex than that. Yep. Um, I actually think the starting point is looking at your own business yep. to work out where you're at. Yep. Because often people go looking over the fence for clues, um, but they might not be the clues that apply to their business. Yes, yeah, it's fair call. G- given that, the again, the research says, and that fascinating stub- study from Western Australia with 259 farms, and when they looked over a 10-year period of what the most important factor was, statistically speaking, it was actually the individual unique characteristics of each farm. Yes, good. So so I'm a little bit passionate about being careful about how we apply comparison studies yep. and, and, and benchmarks, but I, I certainly think we can learn and get ideas yes. and possibilities from um, other people. But I think if we look within our own business and really understand it, we can find out what's probable in terms of what's going to help us. Hmm. Yeah. And and while I'm on that point, do you think that generationally, and, and you've you know probably seen the generation before you and now the generation behind you, generationally, has this conversation changed? Um, question, I, I see that there seems to be a pattern amongst and again, this is a bit dangerous. Going, I'm going in dangerous. That's territory. right. We love dangerous territory. Okay. I, I, I see examples where those characteristics that enable you to to run a good business yeah. and to function well can flow through generations. So I think you, you learn from. Well, we all know we sort of learn from those around us. Yeah. I, I don't know whether the conversation has changed or, or not. To be honest, I think. 
you know, if you look back through the diaries of our own fa- family farm, they're probably all still talking about the same stuff that we're talking about now. Mm. Yeah, and just maybe different numbers. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like my uncle Basil that I mentioned in the book. Yeah, you know, he. he um, he tells these great yarns about uh, in the early 50s when he was starting to buy a bit of land and my um, father was doing the same and and various families were trying to expand back then and everyone was saying that, you know, my Uncle George had paid too much for this um, yeah. <laughs> land and Uncle Basil didn't have the heart to tell the people he was talking to that he was about to marry Uncle George's sister. <laughs> and... Um, and and Uncle George, Uncle Basil, you know, this is these conversations aren't, aren't that long ago because he died at 100. Oh, wow. Um, he used to say to me, you know, money has a habit of falling out of your pocket, but it never falls out of land. And Yeah. Um, and everyone's always going to say it's too dear. So mm. well, I often think about that. And, you know, he goes way back to the 40s when he helped his mum pay off some, some land because their father died quite young. Yeah. And and the same principles that really apply. Yeah. It's it's interesting you say that because I had a client only literally in the last week, they bought some land and I said, Oh, you know, how do you feel about it? Oh, I think I paid too much. And I said, I think I've been hearing that for the last twenty seven years. <laughs> but I could go back exactly. hundred and twenty seven years by the sound of your story. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh I actually did the calculation wouldn't be relevant anymore, but two or three years ago I uh I pulled out the RBA calculator and and converted some prices that that my family had paid along the way into mm. today's dollars. Mm. And when I did it at the time, the land that Grandpa bought on the day Dad was born was the same price of land at Elmore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. One of the things I wanted to ask you today, Kate, was around decision making and priorities. I think you have a. I think that again, there's another story in your book, but I. I and and you have a, a framework in there basically where you try and help people make decisions about what's what is a priority. And I again I have a saying that if you've got lots of priorities, basically you've got none. <laughs> um do you want to talk more around how you frame that up in the book? And because a lot of people wake up, there's always a long laundry list of stuff to do around a farm. And yeah. and there's lots and lots of jobs always. Um your approach to that, how do you work out what is a priority and 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 what's your message in the book around that? Yeah, I guess decision making comes down to you know what the end point is really, mm. and what the outcome is going to be. And and I just did an exercise yesterday. I run a a workshop called Grounded Thinking, mm-hmm. and and basically helping people understand where they gain more awareness about their their mindset at any particular time, and whether it's particularly useful at that time to be making decisions or not. Yeah. But but one of the things I do in that is is use the locus of control and say, well, you know, let's um let's do a, a a liver cleanse and take all the sludge off your liver and write write out your list. And then let's, you know, let's cross out the things that we can't do anything about. Mm. And that leaves us with the things we can do something about. Mm. And then let's let's then put those things into whether they're not important, somewhat important, or very important, mm. and then let's focus on the very important stuff. Mm. And it's actually quite a powerful exercise. I need to do it for myself. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think in the book you talk about if it doesn't, oh, I don't try, I'm trying to paraphrase you here, but basically if you've got a job that doesn't involve the, either the, you know, the revenue or doesn't help the production yeah. Why? Why are you doing it? Sort of attitude. It, it, you go down that rab that rabbit hole in the book, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I try and talk about, I guess, the things that make the most difference. Yes. So it's really tricky on the farm, and um, well, even running my own business too. And I, I work out of home, so it's very mm. easy to get distracted. Mm. Mm. And so, so we've got all these big ticket items like the fundamentals of of production and then there's all the the small little nice to haves or mm. or little you know dirt tracks you can go down and and so I, I just try and keep it really simple when it comes to prioritizing production activities and you know, is it going to um conserve 
moisture for you? Is it going to help you convert that moisture into grain? Is mm. it going to help you cost effectively get that grain off mm. and, and sold? And and some of the things we, you know, we can get distracted with things like row spacings, for example, mm. um, and you probably hear that when people come to talk to you about upgrading their machinery. And um, really, I suppose the question is, is, you know, is row spacings important to you or is it because you really, really like machinery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and but the interesting thing is that, um, and I'm big on this, Kate, is that you need to have a decision-making framework that suits you as a business because otherwise you're just making it up as you go. <laughs> right. And particularly, and this is probably something I, I want, would like to ask you today is that, you know, we've gone probably in South Australia, I don't know, you know, let's call it 40,000 farms in 1980. We're probably halved to 20,000 farms in 2000. I would argue if we did the data today, it's probably halved again to 10,000 farms. And I'm pretty sure going forward, it's going to halve again. That The impact of that um, through the generations is very significant for a lot of farming communities. And it's, it's, it's impacts on strategy around, because you then are farming over greater areas, but it might mean you'd suddenly have to have HR policies. You've got to have your values set. You've got to have your culture set. You've got to demonstrate a team approach um, because you're dealing with, with bigger, bigger groups. Um, it's not just a, a solo show anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Getting some of this stuff right in the book, and particularly, you know, you talk about the people side of it and that emotional intelligence it's just yeah. super critical, isn't it, now with, as these farms get bigger and bigger? It really is. And and I actually think that emotional intelligence and self-awareness, the ability to manage yourself, the awareness of your impact on others and the way how other people are travelling and then your ability to manage that relationship, that's the magic ingredient mm. that separates out the different farm performers. Mm. Uh, when all the benchmarking studies that have been on on this sort of work and they look at the qualitative side of things and they look at people's ability to be organised, take responsibility for their own actions, be accountable, um, be able to gather a heap of information and then work out what it means for them, all of those traits like accountability, for example, um, ability to manage other people, Mm. If you look at a list of, um, you know, from Daniel Goldman's emotional intelligence mm. books, mm. they're all the same. They're mm. all the same traits. Agreed. And and um, you know, I'll talk about footy in the books and saying that, uh, you know, some people are really good at reading the play and some aren't. And, yeah. and humans, we're, we're no different. Yeah. And, and luckily we can develop those skills as well. And I guess... Like I'm big on using the term awareness and it's really important, I think, to stop and think about, okay, we're a multi-million dollar business now mm. and we're sitting on a multi-million dollar asset mm. and we're using the same techniques to organise ourselves and manage ourselves that, that Dad was using when I was six when we weren't that multi-million dollar mm. business mm. now, is that really a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it's interesting because they have the saying of what got you here won't get you there sort of principle. And and yeah, it, it's it, you gotta stop and reflect on those things, don't you? Yeah. And 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 it's really understandable though, because we we like to keep on doing the things we like yeah, doing. And if that's being outdoors or mm. Sitting, sitting in the tractor, mm. meditating without <laughs> even knowing you're meditating. Um, that's all good and well, but I guess it's a matter of recognising that the needs of the business have changed and then work out how to plug the gaps. Mm, absolutely. Before I ask a bit about succession today, is, I want to ask what are the key characteristics or key messages out of the book particularly that you go, well, if you want to be a successful farmer, you've these are the – three or four key things, messages that you see in your, in A, from your, you know, your, your study in the book and so on. Okay, so, so I think the first thing is that understanding that, that you're in the driver's seat. Yeah. And, and taking responsibility. The blame again gets you nowhere in farming. Mm. So, so that's the first message. The second message is that it's a whole system. And the reason I called 
the book Crops, People and Money is all the studies had been that had been done attribute, you know, high performing farms to be technically proficient, mm. to have good business savvy and and good business relationships. And I was chatting to a friend one day and I just said, it's not rocket science, John. If you're good with crops, good with people and good with money, you can be good at farming. Mm. And it just sort of fell out of my mouth. <laughs> And then I tried a thousand different titles, and I thought, "Why don't I just go back cool to what I really, what I really think?" <laughs> ah, it works. I agree. Yeah, and and so that ultimately, and it doesn't obviously not every farmer's a cropper. No, but it could be cows, people, and money. It could be strawberries, people, yeah. and money. You, you get the message. It could yeah. be you know wool, people, and money. But it's being technically good at what you do. Hmm doing it in a cost-effective, financially smart manner mm. and getting the people aspects right, mm. both managing yourself and others. Mm. You know, talking about that, um, you talk about that a bit in the book while we're talking about money is in this day and age, there's probably no excuse not to keep an eye on things, is there, from a money point of view? And, you know, you talk a bit about, um, you know, with cloud-based accounting services and mm. the ability to get data at your fingertips these days. But having a good team around you with utilising good expertise around you, that's part of the the money and the people part, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's recognising the bits that you want to do and enjoy doing Hmm. and the necessary bits that you um, don't necessarily want to do or don't feel you have the expertise and getting the right people around you to keep pushing all those things and 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 it's not simple. Um, it's easy to say. It, it can be difficult to to execute yeah. just to give you to because I, I actually battle with that myself, being a, a sort of a, a sole operator mm. who um, you know gets expertise in to help me do things, mm. and often to just to sit and stop, mm. and um, and then think right, who who do I need to do this, and who do I need to do that. Mm. Um, can be quite, you know. I'd much prefer to be on on the um, on the Zoom or phone chatting yeah. chatting away about my work, like in yeah. Zoom podcasts like this, yeah. rather than uh, sitting down um, doing administrative stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it is human nature, I think, to want to do what we want to do. We gravitate to it. Um, yeah. The part of the book that talks about succession planning, and and you talk about, and one of the parts that resonated with me, you mentioned about. Um, succession planning basically never ends. I think you make a comment yeah. to that effect where you say it's it's an ongoing process and that particularly is something that I 100% agree with. It is it is an ongoing dialogue. It's an ongoing conversation. It's not an event, you know, per se. It's succession planning is, mm-hmm. is not a piece of paper that you suddenly say, oh, here it is and put it in the bottom drawer and move on. It is, mm-hmm. a, it is an evolution, not a revolution. Um you, you you dedicate a fair bit of time talking about succession planning in there. Do you want to elaborate on on your approach to it and and why you think it's so important? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. And I, I guess I fell into doing a bit of work on succession planning by, by accident really simply because when I started to do strategy work with some farms, this kept coming up as an issue. Mm. And it was like, okay, well, we need to, we need to deal with this, and there seemed to be a barrier for for some in terms of you know going to discuss it with one of their financial advisors or their accountant mm. or or their lawyer, because it was actually the conversation, the difficult conversations that needed to be had, um, and and it wasn't so much about the structures or the no. the mechanics behind it, and. So I sort of felt that um, you know, there's some great people, like you mentioned earlier, Je- Jeanette Long and, mm. and Bill Long have been doing this for a long time and, and Judy Wilkinson mm. in SA as well. And um, and I just felt the first step with the people I was working with was just to have the conversations and to help them have conversations and mm. then we could work the mechanics out later. Mm. And, and get them to talk with their various advisors about what those mechanics might look like. But I also saw over the years people that thought they had succession sorted mm. because they had gone and done the mechanical stuff. 
and had more trust than you can poke a stick at and mm. whatnot. Um, back home on the farm, there was one of two things happening. There was either the next generation had taken over complete management control and the previous generation, usually the male partner, was really quite lost yep. and, and felt disenfranchised. Mm-hmm. Or there was the, well, we've done all the the mechanics, we've done our will, you know what's going to happen. I'll just keep farming for a few more years. Mm. But those few more years seem to go on forever. And yeah. next minute you've got this 40, 45-year-old thinking, am I ever going to get a crack? Yeah. And and that's where we call it the dynamics. So you talk about the mechanics of uh, farming. The, what are the dynamics? The dynamics of being a team and how do you inter- interact with one another and, uh, you know, how do people – people are still people. Yeah. Correct, correct. And that's sort of why I came up with that little framework yeah. of shifting through various phases. Because the other thing I, I would see sometimes was you know, the, the junior members of the family coming home and getting thrown in mm. to the deep end a bit, but without giving, giving the support that they really needed. Mm. Yeah. And I think you, you use a diagram where you talk about being mentored, I think, then you move to... I want to say employee, then manager. I can't remember that there's a framework. Yeah, you give so, it there. so I call it intern. Yeah. You know, you go from intern to manager to mentor. That's right, yeah. Then well, elder. And, and the problems that I see start when um, you know, the, the older generation have been managing for a long time and they want to be the mentor, but the younger generation isn't quite ready to step up yes. and is still very dependent. Yep. Or where the mentors can't let go at all and yeah. move gracefully into the elder status and yeah. you end up with, you know, three families all wanting to be manager. Yeah, and that and doesn't, doesn't work. work. <laughs> no, I am very familiar with that some days. And and I think that that diagram and that framework that you give in the book is, again, is is excellent. And um, um, succession planning, so... You know, you have you've obviously worked with families that have you've you've seen some some good succession plans over the years. What are the key elements? Do you think of good success? What does good succession planning look like to you? Uh, to me, it's about expectations. Mm-hmm. It's about conversation and expectations, understanding, actually asking what people want, mm. and having a framework and being able to look into the future mm. and and again. It's an exercise that a lot of planners use where I just try and get people to think about, well, what might they be doing when they're 80 and what will their needs be, Mm. you know? What does 90 look like? What does 70 look like? Or Mm. for the younger generation, okay, you're 25 now, what does 35 look like? Mm. Or 30, once you get that clear picture in your head, you can actually work towards it. Mm. Mm. And, and, you know, right in your realm, that financial independence for the outgoing generation Mm. Um, as opposed to this murky sort of, oh, we'll look after you sort of thing, then, then nobody's happy. No, yeah, that's, uh, that grey area doesn't work for many times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess that's it sound, it's probably sounds very broad, but just everyone understanding where everyone are, what everyone else is thinking saves a hell of a lot of hassles and it all starts with communication. And I guess that's a difficult one. It's usually the the male member of the older or the middle generation, the problems start if that male member then becomes the male member of the older, older generation and mm. still nothing sorted out. Yeah, not going to so fit. Starting the conversation seems to be the hardest thing. I'm just, I'm going to put, just ask you as well that we use the word communication and I know I use it in meetings a lot, but I've started using a phrase where I just call it great communication. Because I think people think they're communicating and they go, well, I'm communicating, Tony, but it can be what I would call, and there's no denying that. But I think that the bar needs to be higher than that in a sense that what is, what is great communication look like? Yeah. What's clarity look like? Yeah. And, and I think that that's, uh, I don't know if you have any comments around that, but I think that some people go, oh, well, Tony, I said that. Well, hang on. But did, was it really the right way of saying it because communication, as you know, can be more than just the words that come out of your mouth. It's your body language, your tone, where, Absolutely. when, how. And 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 that's, I think, that where I think we talk about communication a lot, but I want to know what great communication is. 
Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think great communication, well, part of it is this understanding of so the person who's trying to deliver a message and the person who's receiving the message, actually it's the same message. Yeah. And part of that I think in succession um, is documenting those messages so that in 10 years' time everyone remembers the conversation mm. as it was as opposed to the way it's grown in, in individuals' minds. Mm. Mm. So I think communication, it's its expressing the message and it's also having that chance to, to clarify the message and, and to also document the message. Mm. Yeah, it's... And I think, you know, and I guess that's probably over the last probably two years of, I, I think we've just got to set the bar a bit higher and say, well, you know, let's, let's, um, let's just challenge ourselves to be a bit better at this communication stuff. And Oh, absolutely. And, and I guess the conundrum we've got in family farming businesses particularly is we're, we're not so good at communicating with our families as we are with with other people. You know, mm. you only got to ask my husband that. <laughs> I forget to tell him lots of stuff. And <laughs> and then this morning while having a conversation, he I asked him whether he wanted to have um, needed a lift somewhere because he can't drive at the moment, having just had open heart surgery. Oh, sorry, here, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he's all good. Oh, good. Um, but the interesting thing was. He went, oh, yeah, that's a good idea, and then stopped. And 10 minutes later, so am I driving him somewhere or aren't I driving him somewhere? And he goes, oh, didn't I finish that sentence? He'd finished it in his mind, <laughs> but it hadn't actually come out of his mouth. <laughs> oh, and that's uh, poor communication. <laughs> but some people think it's great communication. Yeah, and 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 I think because your family members, you know, you, you the people you're closest to, you're also the hardest on and the most critical. Yeah, yeah. Of. And so that's a real challenge in a family business situation. Yeah. And I guess on farms where everything's been so informal and the mm. focus is always on the doing, you know, and the, an instruction might be delivered with the tractor grip going full revs and you're sticking your head out the window and, and yell something so you assume you've communicated, but the person in the ute on the ground Mm. with the window down and usually probably the music blaring if he's he or she's in the younger generation, they're not going to hear that anyway. No, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. It, um, do you think a lot of families in that regard then just take each other for granted? I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're family, so it's okay. Oh, you know, it's, it's again, reluctant to generalize, but, but that's yeah. human nature. Yeah. Human nature is you take those closest to you for, for yeah. granted yeah. and, even in in professional advice, I know in small country towns um, where you you might be the advisor of, of your mates, you yeah. know, there's always a risk that that can happen in those situations mm. too. I guess it's um, that's all of this can really be solved by awareness. I think. Yeah, yeah, which you talk about a lot in the book. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess that's why I talk about it so much because mm. it all does boil around to being aware of. Mm. Of these habits, um, both the good and the and the less productive habits. Mm. One um, one question I wanted to to ask today was around you, you. You would have spoken to a lot of I'll call it farmers that are in the sixty to eighty year old generation are probably coming off farm or when I say off farm, but looking at transitioning the farm. What is do you think is the definition of success for them? What does a good outcome look like for a lot of people? you know, leaving behind something they've worked on for 40 years and they've blood, sweat and tears out there. And and what do you think they're looking for out of that process? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I'm sort of just got this flash through my mind yeah. of, you know, various characters yeah. that I'm either related to or <laughs> work with yeah. over the years. I think meaning. Yeah. Meaning and purpose. So it, it seems to be easier for those that can find meaning and purpose outside the farm. Okay, yep. So if they've got, you know, if they're mad passionate golfers, for example, or mm. got involved in, in community work or 
yeah, yeah. community work or right. boards yeah. or, or something like that um, or hobbies, it seems to be an easier transition than those who have tended to spend their weekends farming mm. as much as during the weeks and there's so much of our identity mm. in our work mm. and and I think that's a challenge to work through that to work out well what what am I going to do next mm. if if it's not um associated with the farm you know for those that tend to move away and I guess for those that are still in the area and and transition into that um I guess you'd call them a super mentor mm. where they you know might live in town now but pop out every day and still do lots of useful jobs and are often the one that's providing that skills training to to the intern mm. um you know that they are still able to to retain their purpose and mm-hmm. and their identity and you know play go and play their couple of games of golf a week or mm or bowls or whatever the case may be, mm. um, that, that seems to work pretty well. Yeah, I f- and I find that the crossroads sometimes, Kate, comes when the definition of success for the, you know, if, if, if a generational farmer had been saying, yep, I'm going to pass this on to my, my two boys or two kids, you know, being stereotypical with that, and then suddenly one of the boys gets 20 years down the track and 30 years down the track and doesn't want to do it anymore or financially can't do it anymore or mm. whatever happens. It's an interesting crossroads about what they then had framed as success for them versus what the success for the kids looks like. Um, you know, there can be a conflict of outcomes. Um, yeah. So, so whether they feel like they're a failure. Yeah. Um, because the next generation farming hasn't been for them. Correct. Yeah. That, that that's right. This this leaving a legacy is so important to people. And yeah. And and they have got their success attached to that. Mm. So th- there's a real pride to be able to hear someone say, oh, I'm a sixth generation farmer mm. or a fifth generation farmer. And so um, I, th- I think it's really important to reframe the way we look at um, when a, 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 a farming family's time finishes up. It's yeah. actually to me. It's a if if there's been a um, an asset build up that then then is sold up and that wealth's realised. Well, that's actually a successful outcome. Yeah, that's right. It's just in a different format. Yeah, yeah. So there's certainly no shame in selling yeah. a family farm, as far as I'm concerned. I guess it just gets can be a bit tricky if expectations yeah um, change along the way. Mm. Okay, it's been absolutely um, lovely speaking to you today, and I'm sure we could sit and chat about succession planning till we, to for three hours. But um, look, what's probably just final message, key thing that you, if people go and read your book, what are they going to get out of it? Well, hopefully they get some practical messages mm. on on how to um, move past some of the blocks yeah. to become more aware of their situation and and practical things of how they can, I guess, combine the strength of crops, people and money and be in the driver's seat. Mm, Absolutely. I think that I can read the book myself and it is a great book and and you do give a lot of um, practical examples, but more more importantly, you give a lot of frameworks. I think those diagrams throughout the book that are they communicate the message very, very well, and uh, it, it is it's it's certainly not a difficult read, a difficult read in a in a sense that it flows and it's it's a, it's I found it uh, very enjoyable. So really appreciate you taking the time to write the book, and uh, and I think uh, for anyone out there's wondering about reading it, go get a copy, and you can download I think off your website. Okay, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. So you can order you can order hard copies through the website, yeah. and um, you can download a um, a sample chapter off the website, and there's also a link to um, to Amazon where you can get the e-copies from. And, and the website address is? The website address is thinkagri. thinkagri.com.au. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, and we'll uh, no doubt speak again soon. Thanks, Kate.